Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Futurum Tech Webcast interview series. We're here to talk today to talk about the BSS to cloud journey. Customer-centric business operations and digital engagement allow communication services providers, we'll refer to them as CSPs during the course of this conversation, to monetize on improved customer experiences and support business models for current or future innovations. That's super important. From a strategic perspective, CSP decision makers have to recognize the important considerations that are driving the BSS to cloud journey. Our team at Futurum partnered with Ericsson to develop a research report called BSS to Cloud Journey, Powering Innovation Across the Digital Value Chain. My colleague Ron Westfall at here at Futurum and I are here today and we're joined by Miriam DC and Rick Mallon from Ericsson for a conversation about driving the BSS to cloud journey. So welcome everyone. It's great to have you here. And Miriam, I'm going to start off with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Ericsson. Hi, well, thank you very much for having us, Shelley. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I'm with Ericsson since last year and I'm working in BSS marketing. I'm a uh, BSS Solutions Senior Marketing Manager, I believe my title. And um, what we're really interested in doing is, is understanding the challenges that our customers are facing, our prospects are facing. And, you know, having the, not just the technical conversations around them, but some of the business conversations around these challenges as well and figuring out what is the best way to move forward. So whether we do that in written form or whether we do that using, you know, examples of use cases, whether we draw in product capabilities, it's blending the whole lot together. Awesome. You know, that's kind of a marketing strategy goal, right? Understanding customer pain points and how to solve how to address and solve those, right? Rick, tell us about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Rick Mallon. I'm responsible for the customer and partner engagement portfolio at Ericsson. So that includes all of our catalog products, order management, our CPQ systems, and our digital experience platform. That's awesome. You know, short and, short and sweet. That's Rick, <laughs> right? <laughs> so... Let's talk a little bit about the telecom industry and where that industry is with moving BSS to cloud. What are you seeing from your vantage point in Ericsson Digital BSS across your customer base? Rick, let's start with you. Well, Ericsson's been very successful in the 5G network evolution. So at you know, the last count, over 127 commercial agreements would lead the market with this. So it gives us a unique perspective on the rollout of 5G and you know, and how we adopt BSS to, to help our customers take full advantage of those new 5G network investments, uh, you know, to make money, to improve their revenue situation. What about you, Miriam? Do you have anything to add there? Well, there's a whole heap going on. The network evolution is, is one of these things, and that forces uh, um, a lot of changes in the BSS architecture itself. And we, you know, we're completely confident that there's just so many opportunities to be had at, at this point in time, whether it's with consumer, whether it's with enterprise, or whether it's that, you know, that wild card that we really see a huge, huge scope for expansion, which is the B2B to X space. There's going to be a whole lot of new there, uh, some of which we don't even have full definition around it yet. Right. Um, so we're seeing lots and lots of movement um, to cloud, both public and private. And there's, you know, there's no question about whether to move to cloud. It's just, you know, the focus is how do we get the most out of it? And that kind of sounds simplistic, but it's not because there's just such the, an enormous variation in terms of where everybody is right now, what their starting right. points are. There's also this enormous variation in, you know, where people want their, their end point to be, or at least where people want their end point to be today. Um, so with this big range of variation, like we've got 300 customers around the world and those 300 customers span consumer focus and enterprise focus. They're big, they're small, they're using, you know, our individual BSS components that are convergent charging, mediation, building, order care, product catalog. There's, there's a massive, massive variation and, and diversity to this group of customers. And the one thing we can say with certainty is that there's no kind of single beaten path emerging here and there's no one size fits all when it right. comes to, to moving that BSS to cloud. Um, sometimes there's limitations due to regulation, sometimes due to geographical constraints like the GDPR, but 
what we do see is that most of our customers and most of our prospects are laden with these kind of complex and fragmented legacy systems with intricate uh, integration, kind of connective tissue holding it all together. And all of them are looking to buy new cloud-based systems and, and shift their way down this journey. So this was partly why we wanted to, to do this uh, report right. with you guys. We wanted to get you know, an alternative perspective or an additional perspective, because we know that we're seeing a lot of different things here. And working with you has helped us gather this this really, really useful snapshot of where people are at and where people are headed and what progress has been made and how happy people are at this point in time. Absolutely. And I think that that, you know, you really touched on some incredibly salient points. And I think the one th common thread throughout this is that, you know, organizations all have different nuances, different challenges, different legacy system situations, um, different skill sets on staff, you know, and there's a very real dearth of, um, of IT talent out there. And so I think that is where, you know, figuring out the vendor partner that you want to work with makes a huge difference. Um, because, you know, vendor partners come into a situation with all of the expertise that they've gained from working with other customers with other challenges or similar challenges. And so I think that that's such a, you know, figuring out the technology solution is just one part of the equation, but who is it that I can really hand in hand partner with? I think that that is such a big business decision and, and one that's a really important part of the equation. So um, what kind of, a, what talk with us a little bit, if you would, Rick, about some of the different approaches you're seeing on the customer side here. Yeah, it's, it's just an interesting area. I think, um, you know, if you look across the landscape of, of applications in the BSS space that our operators have, in some cases, they're trying to take existing applications and sort of lift and shift them to, to, to working on a cloud environment versus, you know, an older mechanism of just, you know, deploying on virtual, you know, a virtual machine. So, so we sort of see this one set of uh, applications being lifted and shifted because they're so critical. They don't want to kind of redesign them and rebuild them from scratch. The other approach is more transformative. They're looking for cloud native applications that are based on microservice technologies and, and making sure that they have this uh, future proof architecture in place as they, as they take this journey. And we're sort of seeing the split happen. It's, it's, it's been interesting. I was actually seeing every, an internal report this morning where uh, customers are requesting things that are near network applications. So things like charging systems, mediation systems, they tend to lift and shift those. They tend to leave those on even private clouds, whereas the, the stuff that faces more the customer, so this could be front end systems, uh, ordering systems, uh, digital experience systems, channel systems, tend to be more heading towards the public cloud faster, tend to be more microservice native technology than let's say some of the technology that's closer to the network. And we're definitely seeing you know, a mix of this. Some, some folks are private cloud, and that could be for regulation reasons. So in some cases, you know, different uh, governments are saying you can't expose customer data across, mm -hmm. you know, and through a public cloud. So there's some, you know, some regulations there to be aware of. And in some cases, the regulations have caught up to the cloud infrastructures and it's, uh, it works okay. But we're definitely seeing a mix of these two strategies. I don't think neither one of those is incorrect. It's, uh, I think you're going to see both of those persist for some time. Yeah, I think that that's probably a reality of, of where we are at this particular moment in time. So, so there's so much variation across a customer base, across a prospect base. How do you address that from a product development standpoint? Yeah, I think this is a tough challenge. Uh, you know, we're certainly seeing uh, just a, an incredible variation of uh, technologies and choices in cloud on the cloud native as they move. So uh, multiple vendors, there are various public cloud vendors that have become popular, you know, Amazon Web Services, Google, Azure, or some of the key ones. We're also seeing Red Hat OpenShift, uh, VMware has their Tanzu. So there's so many different uh, varieties of Kubernetes. The strategy that we think is the best one is to just support what we call vanilla Kubernetes, meaning we will make sure our application works on the vanilla Kubernetes coming out of the open source community. And as various variants of Kubernetes are taken by other vendors, we'll just make sure we stick to the middle of this, make sure we can do the vanilla. That way it makes our porting costs manageable for us. And it just becomes a kind of a testing exercise as we support another variant. Interesting. Ron, 
Hello. I haven't, I haven't forgotten you. <laughs> Never would I forget you. I would love for you to hop into this conversation and just talk about, you know, t- talk a little bit about your your thoughts on what has to happen on the customer side as they progress through their cloud journeys. Excellent question. And I think uh, we're seeing uh, some clear indicators as to how, you know, a CSP can successfully implement a a journey and certainly advance it uh, to their satisfaction. On one uh, hand, strategically, I believe uh, the operators need an organization wide blueprint, a commitment across all of the different business units to ensure that the uh, cloud journey is uh, touching all of the different units and that they're able to, in essence, be on the same page and implement uh, you know, the different operational uh, improvements and also improve the business processes in order to uh, take full advantage of you know, the cloud capabilities that are both uh, in-house and also uh, with their uh, partners naturally. And in addition, I think uh, what's important in that regard is uh, encouraging uh, the use and adoption of open APIs. I think uh, the open APIs are going to be very vital, not only in terms of you know, interworking with uh, partners and uh, naturally uh, customers, but also I believe it will aid the in-house process of you know, reducing silos and so forth to enhance uh, for example, DevOps frameworks, as they look to have a more agile software development framework to really, uh, you know, meet uh, these uh, cloud objectives. So, yeah, to kick that uh, question off, uh, those are some of the key takeaways that I'm seeing today in the uh, in the industry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about you, Miriam? Do you have something to add there? So, you know, it's funny. Um, there's Recently, I talked with some engineers um, and I was saying, like, you know, I'm looking at cloud. I know you're working with cloud. Could you maybe share some of your experiences in blog format? And the first thing every engineer that I spoke with wanted to talk about was culture. It wasn't anything to do with any of the technology, but they wanted to talk to that massive, massive culture shift that that needs to happen, the mindset yeah. change, the everybody being on board to, you know, particularly if you're looking at going like fully cloud native with CI CD pipelines, that is a very, very big change throughout the, the organization. And um in telco in particular, with you know the need for everything being telecom grade and there's a little bit of fear around change because if it is Absolutely. broken, you don't fix it, you just you know you leave it be. And there's this also this uh, very, very pervasive belief that when things go wrong, it's because of some change somebody was trying to make. Right. So there's a, a causality there between change and bad things happening. Yeah. So you know, and the, the paradox of, of it all is you know, paradoxically the answer is to all of this is to make more frequent change. Just get that pipeline right. flowing, make things happen, you know, in smaller in smaller uh, packages instead of these big, big old software development life cycles. So, um, so yeah, you know, I think, and Rick would, would you know, I'm sure agree here as well, is that, that both sides need to be moving at the same pace with the same plan in mind because you can't just lob something over the wall in a completely different way than it used to happen in the past as if that's going to be absorbed well. Everybody needs to be on the same page. Yeah, absolutely. You know, strategy, a blueprint, to Ron's point. Um, you know, and I will say that, you know, we do a lot of work around digital transformation. And, you know, your point is so well made, um, successful transformation. Um, so many times people think about, you know, it's improved processes, it's technology solutions, but the reality of it is the magic ingredient of successful transformation is people and creating a culture of innovation and change and willingness to change and a culture of continuous learning. And, you know, a technology solution alone is never the answer because we've got tons and tons of examples of, you know, a technology purchase that was made that you know, is never used because the work didn't happen on the front end, aligning all the stakeholders, doing the blueprint, creating a strategy and, and, you know, there, there lies the challenge. So what about you, Rick? Did you have anything to add um, in terms of what needs to happen on the customer side as they go through this cloud journey? Yeah, it's a, it's a sweeping change in their culture that, that we see as sort of a key success factor. So 
we, we've just finished a project. It's gone in production just before Christmas with a tier one operator in, in Asia. And the, the, the big difference in this project versus others I've worked on is everyone got involved at the and then got put in the same room right at the beginning of the project. So yeah. before we even wrote a line of code, we had, you know, myself, my, my product management, my architects sitting in the room with the customer architects, but more importantly, they're business folks. So we had folks that would work, you know, the CSRs, the agents that would be using these front end systems to deal with customers. We had marketing people in the room with us. We had testers in the room with us. We had UI designers in the room with us. And we all went through the scope together, you know, screen by screen, workflow by workflow, item by item to understand the behavior of the system and all agree on it. Right. The result was delighted CSR agents at the end of the project. Now in production, it works. We didn't have to go back and get all these, uh, oh my God, you know, the portal was not good enough. It takes too long to click around on things. It's designed perfectly for that, for that experience. Yeah. That couldn't have been done if we weren't all in the room together. Big change. Absolutely. It just, it, it totally is a game changer. So let's look at the day-to-day -day reality of, of continuous improvement. Um, and can, you know, uh, t talk with us a little bit about that, if you would, Rick. You know, it's, <laughs> this is a journey I think we're still on, uh, to be <laughs> honest. So one of the things we've learned is that backwards compatibility is, uh, is, is like a religion now. So you have right. to really focus hard on your every portion of your software, every API you write, every screen you write, and make sure that as you introduce new capabilities, what used to work still works and because people have built on that. So as you're using right. a CICD pipeline to put new software into their hands every four weeks or so, you got to make sure what you used to have working still works. Right. That requires a tremendous discipline inside R&D. It requires automated test suites to, that you can run at a push of a button to you know, test, have 10,000 test cases, test for backwards compatibility, and make sure we, we haven't broken anything. So that's just sort of vital. I think there's another piece to this, which is on the customer side. You know, A lot of them aren't ready for an upgrade of your system You know, minimum once a year. Like If you look at some of our older contracts, they're four and five year life cycle contracts. Right. They, they don't have to upgrade for four or five years. We'll keep supporting that ancient sort of software for that right. long with simple patches and fixes. Now they've got to upgrade a minimum of a year, once a year. Uh, they have to be ready for these kind of DevOps way of working. And some of them are, you know, have to adjust their processes to, to deal with that and their procurement for that matter. Yeah, it, it really is a very interesting environment. I know from a strategy standpoint, um, you know, even, you know, if I'm working on a brand strategy with a client, you know, and somebody wants a, you know, a five-year plan, uh, you know, after I chuckle, <laughs> the first thing I say is that's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to do a year-long plan because what we're going to do is we're going to map out a six-month plan. We're going to reevaluate at the six-month point and we're going to figure out what we need to change moving forward for the remainder of the year. And I think that, you know, again, it's a business mindset. And there was a point in time when you could buy something or do something and it, and it something you could keep in place for four or five years or more. And I think that, you know, technology has just evolved at such a rapid pace and will continue at an even more rapid pace that that, that way of thinking um, definitely has to change. Miriam, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what your customers are trying to achieve or fix as they progress in their cloud journey. So, well, um, we'll hopefully get Ron involved in this as well. because we Absolutely. Have some data around this, but the business value is clear. And one of the things that's quite nice to see is that we see um, a lot of, of aiming and reaching for the top line, you know, this revenue generation um, ambitions. Um, and, you know, the, there's there's definitely a lot of, of business value to be had here. There is, there's no doubt. Uh, cloud native applications, they're, they're going to support growth, they're going to support agility, they're going to support flexibility, and they're going to help reduce bottlenecks. Um, and as part of that, there's, there's there's a lot of kind of more feature level things that, that will happen in the meantime, like simplified lifecycle management and integrations right. and improved availability and, and things like that, high availability, and also the CICD pipelines that, that we talked about before. So what I thought was super interesting in, in the data as we gathered was that uh, while a lot of early cloud conversations were very cost focused, that the cost actually should have last on this list when people were asked about 
their top objectives for, right. for going to cloud. And what what did show up top of the list actually ties into what Rick was mentioning there earlier. It's it's those kind of um, outer engagement systems that that need to be you know moved along quickest or, or furthest because what people are trying to do first and foremost is improve the customer satisfaction right. and increase the agility that, that they have in getting new products out to, to market. So it's all about that, you know, revenue generation potential, um, which is super strong to see. And and there's everything then in between along the way. There was there was a super range of of um options there from you know supporting AI and ML for predictive analytics and handling scale in every which way that, that you, you turned up and also improving customer loyalty as well as the customer satisfaction that, right. that came on top. So, you know, those those two first items are all in the, the front end systems. And um, what we hear that 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 our customers are saying is, is what they need is is to be able to, to support the choices that they're making today, but also they're also quite clear that they're changing their mind about what those choices are probably going to be tomorrow. So there's there's a forward-looking view that's kind of different to the decisions that have been made to date. And we know we need to keep that in, in mind as well. So um, yeah, that supporting those choices is, is paramount from our perspective. So Ron, you have been elbows deep in this research for many months now. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about, you know, we asked we asked folks to identify their key business objectives driving their BSS to cloud journey. Were there any of these results that surprised you? Well, I think it's fascinating. And uh, yes, as uh, a, a takeaway, uh, to uh, Miriam's point, uh, there's no doubt uh, the, the operators are becoming more committed prioritizing, you know, how do we really get cloud right? And so that I think is something that uh, is important. It's no longer, you know, kicking the tires. It's like, this is integral to how we're going to compete long-term successfully. And uh, as a, a key part of that, uh, again, agility is vital. You know, it's that ability to not only respond to market conditions, but also to work better with partners to also certainly uh, meet, you know, new customer demands in a must uh, faster way. And I think that's uh, certainly something that is at the top of the list is time to market, uh, whether it's getting a new capability out or uh, being able to modify an existing uh, service plan. Uh, we're certainly seeing uh, operators committing to, for example, uh, allowing uh, customers to upgrade to unlimited premium plans as you know part of their 5G uh, investments as as one example and also you know enabling fixed wire access as a viable uh, service that will make a big difference in terms of uh, for example reducing uh, the digital divide and I think uh, what's also important here is that uh, there's a shift away from okay cost reduction as being you know the lead incentive for you know embarking on the cloud right. journey or advancing uh, the cloud journey that's always going to be important you always have to keep an eye on you know maintaining containing operational expenditure costs and then naturally capital expenditure costs but it's not the the top reason it anymore. Uh, as we understand, operators can only uh, cut so much uh, before they really have to get down to what is our strategic vision? You know, how are we going to really leverage uh, these cloud assets to really uh, meet uh, these business objectives, uh, certainly when it comes to agility and you know, time to market? And so, yeah, those are certainly uh, some fresh key takeaways from our research. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. You know, another interesting part of our survey was when we asked about barriers or challenges that that our, our respondents expected to impede them along the way or that were already getting in the way of, of the success of their BSS to cloud journey. Do you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of the challenges you see customers facing on your end, regardless of what the survey said? What what challenges do you see your customers, and how does that really um, how does that line up with what our research told us, Rick? Yeah, I, th I think it's it's tough. It's tough for them. Uh, I, you know, you have a sort of a the pedigree in telecom is you know nine five nines reliability availability. So th these types of systems we've had to build over the last hundred years to to get to that kind of quality or 
they are incredible systems and they require you don't change things too much. The problem is, you know, change is now the thing. You have to be able to manage and master change. It's coming at a faster pace than ever before. Whether we have new types of network technologies like virtualized network functions or 5G network slicing, these are coming in your network at the speed of software, not the speed of hardware anymore. So things have really sped up in the network. And you, you, know, you want to make more money, so you need to monetize these things. That means you're going to be rolling out new services. You're going to be partnering with other applications outside of your systems. Right. All of this change is completely foreign to the DNA of a telecom business. So right. learning how to work in the new world is a, is, a, is a challenge for them. The ones that we see that are succeeding at this, maybe they're starting with a smaller project, um, are really uh, putting the you know, organization on its head and having success. And I think that's, that's the, you know, we go back to that culture conversation. This is this big thing that has to change in the telecom groups. Right. Right. Well, and I think that, you know, when it comes to tra success with any kind of change transformation, you know, I, I think one point that you hit on is, you know, smaller groups, smaller test groups within an organization, because sometimes when, you know, sometimes what you need is that proof of concept to get people on board, to get the, you know, the thumbs up for um, a budgetary investment, right? Those sort of things. And sometimes it is looking at, from a strategic standpoint, what is our lowest hanging fruit? Who, what group can we possibly work here with that we think we have the biggest part, the biggest chance of success with? And I think sometimes approaching it in that way um, can lead to greater understanding and greater adoption. And, and like you said, this is just a huge shift in the way telcos have had to operate, have had to think, and you don't really have a lot of time. You know, there, there really isn't, I mean, th these are changes that are not like nice to make. These are really kind of business mission critical changes ahead. You know, I think that the C-suite that's, sorry, Miriam, I think the C-suite that's super involved in, in participating and super clear on what the end state looks like. Yeah. Then they're able to take a smaller project and fit it into the, you know, proving out chunks of that journey. Now, right. you know, don't try and do it all at once. Right. Don't try and take your whole business down this path at the same time. You'll, you'll end up with one of those five-year, you know, expensive projects that doesn't deliver value at the end. So right. the guys that are led by the C-suite, very clear, you know, first project with, with, you know, with a great team wrapped around it, they're, they're seeing success. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Ron? Um, you know, going to the data, do you see any anything here that surprised you? Well, it's uh, interesting that, uh, as, as Rick mentioned, that, yeah, the C-suite definitely is more involved in the decision making here. And uh, they tend to uh, be very positive about, you know, what's going on in, uh, with the progress of the cloud journey. And it's uh, slightly distinct with uh, what's going on in, uh, with the developers and the engineers who are, you know, looking at, you know, very specific hybrid cloud implementation requirements, uh, really looking uh, closely at what is needed to, you know, make a cloud native uh, implementation uh, work uh, optimally in terms of distributed workloads, et cetera. And I think what this is pointing to in terms of, you know, what uh, we see with the data is that uh, the operators, the CSPs uh, really do need uh, better ways of collaboration between the network operation side and the IT side. Uh, we're seeing progress. Uh, we alluded to it earlier, the DevOps frameworks help. Uh, the uh, ability to leverage open APIs, et cetera. And I think uh, that is certainly uh, a takeaway in terms of, you know, talking with the uh, CSPs, you know, what is, you know, a key challenge, a key impediment that needs to be addressed. And, you know, the answers are there. It's just a matter of uh, more emphasis and priority of, you know, having a workforce that is, is bilingual, if you will, you know, can that really understand, you know, the network side and the IT side and really how to uh, synthesize them optimally in terms of, you know, let's getting this BSS to the cloud journey uh, as right as possible. Absolutely. So what, um, Mary, talk with us a little bit about what looks like it's working well from your side. How can CSPs increase the likelihood of successful outcomes beyond what we've just spoken of? So, well, interesting, connected to what we were just speaking of, I think one of the biggest challenges that, that one of the early on challenges, and then it comes back and repeats and repeats, is, is setting those 
those ambitions, setting those intentions, you know, getting the the buy-in left, right, and center to to get everybody on the same page there. And it's arguable that, you know, if you set out with a simpler ambition on a shorter journey, you know, you're gonna get there pretty quickly, pretty easily, and you're gonna be pretty happy. But then what we see is that that very often having completed that that simpler journey, there's a rethink and a reset and the confidence has been built and and there's other possibilities that are now open because a little bit of progress has been made. So I think the results that we see when when we ask this question out there are, are really interesting here because we see a lot of satisfaction with the lift and shift. We see, you know, people that they set out to do it, they do it, it worked as they wanted it to. Um, but what we also see is that we, we feel like we from where we're standing, we're seeing more far-reaching results. So what Rick referred to earlier in terms of when it's part of something bigger, part of a, a bigger cloud transformation, part of a digital transformation, but yet still manageable. We're very much in favor of the stepwise approach, not everything all at once. That's just too much. Right? Right. But, you know, the, 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 the bigger kind of impact we see is, is when people go on those more ambitious journeys. Um, so we feel that that there's still, you know, a lot of people working their way through that experience in terms of of uh, realizing that there's there's uh, further places to go. Right. You know what we do know to be true is that it is the organizations who take a deep breath and go all in from a financial investment standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from a culture of change standpoint, those are the organizations that are really seeing massive change. And it's hard to do, but the reality of it is, is that those, you know, those success stories are not hard to find. And, and I think across the board, we do know that, that that is sort of the path to success. So as we wrap up, Rick, talk to us a little bit about just, just you know, what advice do you give your customers and prospects um, as they progress on their BSS cloud journeys? Yeah, I think, you know, my advice is with these sorts of projects is generally the same, which is start small. So, you know, don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to uh, change everything at once because it just the scope of the project becomes unmanageable for everyone involved. And then be just laser beamed on scope. And one of the things that we used sort of very successfully in one of these projects is uh, we, we set a, a line in the sand. We said this project had to be done by, you know, October. We, we were talking starting in January and we didn't budge from that. So the customer didn't blink, you know, Ericsson didn't blink. <laughs> and that the date became the date. And, and that allowed us to manage the scope to that date. So if, if we were together as a team saying, you know what, if you add that extra feature at this late date, that's going to push the date. So then we would all work together to find a solution that we sort of met their needs, maybe without the full scope. So. I think you have to do things like that or else the project uh, you know, spins out of control. Right. So having some sort of, you know, laser beam on governance, on scope, keeping it small was, was these are the ways to succeed. Awesome. I think we all agree on that, on that front. So for our audience, this is going to wrap up this conversation. Thank you so much for, for joining us and, and um, you know, being a part of, you know, conversation around the BSS to cloud journey. Um, I hope that we've whetted your appetite to uh, read our research report when it is published, which will be very, very soon. And, um, you know, know that uh, you are not alone on this journey. There are others walking that same path and there are vendor partners like Ericsson there to be a part of your success story. And um, again, thank you, Ron and Miriam and Rick for being a part of this conversation. It's always great to hang out with you guys. 